Hi everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Allie, and I'm the Senior Director of Product Development Partnerships here at Nations Photo Lab. And I'm here with my colleague, Laura, who is our Content and Partnership Specialist. Before we get started, can everyone hear us? If so, type in yes in the chat box, box on the right side of your GoToWebinar window. Excellent. Well, lots, of yeses. lots of yeses is always a good sign. Great. So before we get started, I want to thank you all again for taking the time to learn from one of our favorite photographers and partners, Matt Kloskowski. Nathan's Photo Lab has been working with him since 2015, and we are so excited to be able to host such an exciting and such an exciting webinar like this with him. And for those of you unfamiliar with Nations, we're a full-service photo lab based in Maryland, and we are specializing in those professional quality photo products at those industry-leading prices you're looking for. So stay tuned for an exclusive just for you guys promo code. It'll be good for $25 off your order at NPL. And without any further ado, I'd love to introduce our host, Matt Kloskowski, who is a world-renowned Tampa-based landscape photographer, author, and speaker. He's written over 20 books and continues to present workshops about Lightroom and Photoshop worldwide. So I'll turn it over to our presenter, Matt. Well, thanks, guys, and uh, hello to everybody out there. It's a uh, big, uh, big thanks to Nations for uh, for hosting this and giving me a quick opportunity to uh, to give you guys some some tips for editing uh, editing your landscape photos. Um, it's uh, it's it's pretty much. I, I, I show you a couple tips and techniques, um, and and it's a lot of workflow too. So in just showing you a tip, uh, I think a lot of times, like when I have a photo, I'll actually just process it too. So you'll actually see some of the start to finish of it, but um, I'll kind of work little tips and techniques into there. But it's a it's I tried to keep it short to where it was just to where it's just kind of five quick tips that I I think of when editing my photos because believe it or not, when when you see like one of the before and afters. Um, of like a full edit, I, I don't know if this is good or not, but like I'm pretty simple in my editing. I, I don't I don't use a ton of different apps. I don't use a ton of different programs, um, and I, I try to keep it fairly simple. It's not that I don't like editing. Um, it's that I necessarily don't have hours and hours and hours to sit there with a photo. So I tr it's it gets pretty repetitive when I show my my tutorials and stuff. So that's why I just like to work in the different tips because. Some photos need them, some photos don't, and this way you'll kind of be more equipped as you as you work through photos to see which ones do and don't. Um, so the first one is going to be on on one of the most common things that I see out there, and uh, and that is uh, that is we tend to process clouds. Um, the, there's so many contrast like plugins. So whether you're using Lightroom, whether you're using Photoshop. Um, I, I work full time for On One, so I use a lot of On One apps, and I know a lot of other people use On One um, or other plugins out there. These these detail-like apps have become really, really popular. Um, so what what they are is basically clarity inside of Lightroom or or clarity on steroids and and some other program. And what they do is I'm going to crank clarity up for for this example here. And and so what clarity does, just if you want to get a little bit techy here. Um, Contrast, because clarity adds contrast. Contrast boosts whites and blacks. So contrast basically, if, if you're going to look at your histogram, contrast kind of takes the whites over here and the blacks over here and boosts them. So if I kind of crank that up, you'll see um, it's not really working too much over here, but on the edges. Well, but there's a lot of other detail in your photo that needs contrast. So clarity tends to work right in those middle areas that aren't necessarily black, they're not necessarily white, and kind of give those those some contrast. So what people do is, is they grab the clarity slider and they crank it up, okay? Um, and what that does is that introduces a lot of halos. Um, you'll kind of see a little bit of it back here. See if I do before and after. See a little bit of a glow on that edge. And then also what it does is it, it makes clouds almost black all right. See how the clouds start to get really dark, and it almost gives the clouds a dark glow around it. You can kind of see that edge that they start taking on. So we want to try to avoid that, but we still want the advantages. So to me, what clarity really does is, is if you showed me a before and after, what I like about the clouds is that they have a new depth and dimension to them. They almost, they almost, 
they feel 3D, and that's what we want to try to help our photos do. Um, is, is we want to give them that lifelike quality, especially landscape and nature and outdoor photos, because I'm bringing back this scene to somebody who wasn't there, and I'm trying to make them. I'm trying to make you feel like you're part of the scene, like you can experience what I experienced. So. We, we realize, obviously, we can't do this. We can't just crank up clarity. So what can we do? Uh, in Lightroom, I'm going to show you a couple of different techniques here. In Lightroom, we have a brush all right, up here in the top right corner. And what I can do with that brush is you'll see part of the effect of that brush is clarity. So I can take, I can crank up my clarity here, and I can start to paint on the clouds. All right. And you're not actually going to see, it actually happens pretty, pretty in a very subtle way, I guess I should say, which is a good thing because you don't want to see it. But uh, I'm going to paint on it here. I'm just going to keep painting. And you're not, I, I think it's going to take seeing the before and after before you really see everything that I did here. And by the way, there is a, uh, if you look down here uh, in the bottom, there's an auto mask checkbox. If I don't check that, what's going to happen is, is as I start to get out to these edges, you almost saw like a little dark, splotch start to appear there. So what I'll do is I'm going to undo that brush stroke and I check that auto mask because what it's going to do is keep my, my brush strokes refined into the clouds. So I'm just painting down here. Painting on the edges of these clouds just right up here. You got to be careful. I'm not going to be able to get every single little one because eventually I, you know, those will get that, that drop shadowy glow. Um, to them. So I'm not really going to try to get every single cloud, but I'm going to try to get the big, the big groups of them here. All right. And and by the way, guys, I, I'll I'll stop every so often and take some questions. So if you come up with something, feel free to ask it. All right. So we'll go ahead and uh, now there's a little toggle switch right at the bottom. So I'm going to turn it off. Remember, I said you're not really going to see it till the before and after. So that's before. That's after. So it gives just a new depth and dimension to the clouds. What's cool about this is that there's a few different things that I can do here. For starters, when I see the before and after, um, to me, I can start to see some of the darkness come back in the clouds in those dark gray areas. So what you can do is because you did this with a brush and because you have all these other controls, that gray area is going to be in the shadows. Okay. So if I crank up my shadows, because I don't, I can't, I don't have to just use clarity. I can do shadows too. If I crank up my shadows and maybe even a little on the exposure, I can start to get rid of that that darkness. Okay. So again, that's before, that's after. What's really neat about this is if you go over to that little pin that the brush drops down, and you can actually see what you've brushed over. If you right click, you can choose duplicate, and you can enhance the effect. It basically doubles the effect. So now, if I show you, that's before. That's after. Now you really get a feel for what we're doing to the photo here. So I can add, I can add the adjustment. I can almost stack it on top of each other. And if it's too much, just pull back on your clarity, and you don't have to use so much of it there. But um, really neat little trick for doing that. I'm going to go, I'm going to reset this. Um, if you want to go, if you want to go to the next level, so it, this is by all means not mandatory. Really depends on your workflow. Um, I use I use other apps in my workflow, especially for landscape photos. So one of the ones I use have I work for the company, but I honestly like I didn't go to work I didn't go to work for the company and then start using the apps. I actually used the apps and then went to work for the company. But on one has an effects app, and what it does is I'm going to go ahead and edit the photo in on one. Um, it's just got a little bit. It's got some more features in it that make these jobs a little bit easier. So one of them is called, if you go into the filters menu here, uh, dynamic contrast. And what dynamic contrast does is it adds a setting similar to clarity. To me, it's a little bit better than clarity um, in that it lets me work on the details in a really neat way. It adds detail and contrast, but it lets me work on small details, which small details are going to be the stuff in here. I don't really want to do too much to that right now. But medium and large details are going to be like your puffy clouds and different parts of the photo here. So it lets me kind of add a little bit to those different areas of the photo. I am getting the same effect. You can probably see some of that glow and that it looks like the clouds have a shadow. So there's going to be a couple things we can do here. 
what's nice about what these filters from other programs will let us do is they usually give us some more features in Lightroom. A lot of them have layering uh, capabilities to them, regardless of which one you use. So what I can do here is when I open up the advanced section, uh, there's an area where I can tell it I want to apply this to certain parts of the photo. So I can tell I want to apply it to the whole photo or just the highlights, just the midtones. Midtones are bad. Look, see where, see how, the, see how dark the the clouds get, or the shadows. So what I'm going to do here is apply it to the highlights, and then I'm actually going to go in here, and I'm going to add another dynamic contrast filter, and I'm going to take this one, and I'm going to go to the same section and apply it to the shadows. And what I did by not doing midtones, I was able to keep it, for the most part, away from some of those areas here. And you can always reduce the opacity as well. Each each layer has its own opacity. So um, all these detail programs, they come up, they come with a lot more features than Lightroom. And uh, I can maybe drop that one down a little bit too. But let me show you the before and after, and you'll just see an overall detail and 3D quality. So that's before. That's after, and I might reduce the opacity of both layers here just a little bit more. But hopefully you get the idea. So there's there's obviously different ways to do things. If you're trying to keep it really simple, um, by all means, the, the Lightroom method is, is totally fine for doing that. But if you want to start to work and go a little bit further along with it, um, you can get a lot of control with some of these extra plugins. Uh, and by the way, I know uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw it up here is... I got a code for you just in case. And I'm going to throw it up on the screen and we can even mention like nations. So if you go to on1.com and use the code nations, um, they gave everybody 30% off of the uh, the effects plug. All right, so uh, let's go ahead. I'm going to hit apply here and that'll just take us right back to Lightroom. So that's the workflow. If you go into Photoshop or wherever, when you apply, it takes you back to Lightroom with a copy. Um, of your photo. All right. So that's a, that's a quick one on clouds. Let's talk about another one here. And this one is, is haze. This is going to come up a lot. And this is, you know, landscape, outdoor photos, um, even portrait photos. You, a lot of, you know, depending on the location, if you're shooting in a very scenic location, what you tend to get is a very hazy background here. Um, it just needs, it, it looks like it's sharpening, but it's actually not sharpening. It just, there's, there's light, there's glare, there's all these things that contribute to making it look hazy. So, nice part about this is inside of Lightroom, they actually gave us a dehaze slider. So, when I take this and I start to crank it up, you can see, I'm going to zoom in because this is really the area we want to concentrate on. You can see a lot of that haze go away. What you're going to find is it's going to it's going to mess with the color of the photo. Look at the sky. See how the sky gets really kind of oversaturated blue. Um, it's going to mess with the color of the photo. And then and and that uh, to me that's a the theory and the of a lot of what's going on here. Um, anybody that's watching that's a portrait photographer and and I know from the portraits I shoot, it's we can control a little bit more. We can control sometimes our location. If we use lighting, we can control a lot of that. When you're in the outdoors and, and you're just taking pictures of landscapes, you have zero control. I, I can't pop a flash and think I'm going to light a mountain. So we have zero control. So what you'll find is a lot of our techniques are based on trying to apply it to just part of the photo because we have such contrasty situations. So we know dehaze isn't necessarily doing the trick here, even though it gives us the look that we want. But same thing as before, if we go to the adjustment brush here, you'll see that there's a dehaze option. So what we can do is I'll crank up dehaze, and then I'll just take my brush, and I'll start to brush. And it's probably overdone, so I can always pull back on it later. But now I'm able to brush this over the parts of the photo that I want. All right. There is an auto mask. Remember, I pointed it out before. And what that'll do is, as I start to brush near the sky, it's going to try to do a pretty good job of keeping it refrained from, you know, basically hitting the sky. And the other little tip for you, this is like a side tip. This doesn't count as one of your tips. Um, is turn it off once you've done the edge, 
because you don't want it to hold back from the other areas here. So, and it will sometimes. So we can go in here and just paint that dehazing right onto the mountain. To me, these trees look, these trees back here look a little bit hazy as well. So I'll just hit them. All right, and then I can control it. So if that's too much, I can just pull it back. But I have total control with the slider here. So you see, that's before, that's after. Um, and I'll show you one more trick with this, which is I'll hit reset. What will happen is, is sometimes, sometimes it becomes almost counterproductive. And this is really if, if, you're, if, you're, if your workflow includes Photoshop as well. Sometimes it, it becomes almost counterproductive to try to painstakingly paint the details of something. Um, Photoshop's really good at selection. So what I could do is I could go down here to... Um, I'm going to right click on the photo. I'm going to do something uh, that, that Lightroom's really good at, which is I'm going to create what's called a virtual copy. So what I just did, if you look down here, I'll even drop it and move it next to it. What I just did is I just created a fake copy of that photo. All right. Even though it's fake, it's not taking up any space, but it's like another version. So it's actually it's letting me go in here and, and have another version of my photo to work with. So let's say this version, I crank up the dehaze. All right. It's obviously affecting parts of the photo bad. Well, if it becomes counterproductive, if it's taking you too long to use that brush to brush in and brush out, one of the things you can do is if you shift click and you select both of those photos down here in the film strip, and you go to photo, edit in, go down here and say open as layers in Photoshop, what it'll do is it's actually going to take both versions of that photo and it's going to open them in Photoshop, but it's going to stack them on top of each other. All right. So below, I have the, the haze reduction layer. On top, I have the original. And now what I can do is I can take, because Photoshop's really good at selections, so I can take some of my selection tools. Um, I always use my favorite one as the, uh, the quick selection tool. I can take some of my selection tools, and I can just make a very, very quick selection of the sky. Um, and then you can see it kind of selected too much, so just Option or Alt click. And I'll get rid of some of those little areas there. And, uh, and now I can use Photoshop because now I have layers. See, Lightroom didn't have layers. So now I have layers, so I can, I can kind of mix and match. I can, get to, I can kind of take the best parts of each version of the photo. I can mix and match them with each other to, to make sure that I'm only seeing the good parts. So on top we got the, uh, or on the bottom we got the haze reduction. On top we got the normal photo. If I click the layer mask icon, a little, uh, another little side tip for you is that if there's a selection and I click the layer mask icon, what happens is what's in the selection stays. So think of it that way. I have a selection. If I click layer mask right now, What's in the selection stays. What's in the selection is the original sky, which is exactly what I want. So when I click this, see what happened? Look at my layers. It made this mask for me automatically because I made that selection. And all it's showing is the top layer, which is the sky. And then it's kind of poked through, punched through to show the dehaze layer on the bottom. All right. So couple of different ways to get to the same place. It really just depends on how complex your photo is. And that's why I want to show you both of them because sometimes it can be a matter of just moving a slider or using a brush in Lightroom. There's going to be those times if you have a little bit more of a complex selection between the sky and that foreground where you might want to come into Photoshop because Photoshop is actually really good at making selections where uh, and having layers where Lightroom doesn't necessarily have those capabilities to it. Um, and then to, to finish the workflow, if you just go to File, Save in Photoshop, don't save as, just save. When you go back over here to Lightroom, you'll see it made a copy, and now it'll actually show me my layered version. So there's one version, there's two version, and then this one here is my layered version that's got the good sky and uh, that nice dehazed uh, middle ground inside of there. Okay, so... I've been gabbing on here for, for a little while here. I'll stop for a second, and uh, if anybody has any questions, just feel free to shout them out there in the question section. Anything? Um, we actually had a question um, come up about the big difference, or is there a difference between the dehaze slider and the contrast slider? 
Yeah, there there definitely is a difference, and probably one of the, the main things I can do is show you exactly what it is. So let's go take go take our contrast slider and I'll crank it up. Okay. And then I'll go, remember we had that virtual copy, it's like that fake version of the photo, but it's another version. So I'll go over here and I'll crank up the dehaze. Oh, let me just move them next to each other. So to me, when I see dehaze, and they, they do look a little bit similar. Here's the other thing. Sometimes they look similar, sometimes they don't. All right. Uh, we'll get to this photo in a second. I'm going to just pull back. Let's pull back on my exposure on this photo a little bit so you can see that mountain back there. If I crank up the contrast here, all it's making is the, the white's whiter and the dark's darker. But my guess is, is if I hit this with some dehaze, that mountain becomes more pronounced. So that's actually a really good example. To me, this one, contrast and dehaze look pretty similar. Dehaze attacks that a little bit more, but to me, this is actually a, a pretty compelling example. See how much more pronounced that mountain back there gets? All right. And when I did that with the contrast slider, it's not really changing it at all. So I guess the answer is, is sometimes they're going to look similar, but sometimes there's going to be a, a big difference. But it doesn't help you too much, does it? Try both. All right, we, uh, we good on questions? Yep, we're good so far. We'll um, keep asking those questions, and we'll we'll touch base again soon. Okay. All right. Next up, let's talk a little bit about. So, tip number three. Tip number three is we we want to use depth. Um, to me, depth is such an, an important part of 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 making making these landscapes feel real and better and everything. Um, Best way that I can explain this is, and we've all experienced this. You, uh, you, you, you get out somewhere, you look through the the viewfinder of your your camera, and you see a scene, and you're like, cool, that looks great. And then you take the picture, and it, it never looks like that. All right, somebody's gonna make a lot of money one day when they invent the make this look like my viewfinder button. But uh, it, it's, it's, it, it never looks like that. And that partially, part of the reason is, is, is our eyes can see so much. We can see so much depth and dimension and detail. And our cameras can't, don't have that range. You always hear the term dynamic range. Our cameras just don't have that amount of range in it. So what we want to do is we want to we wanna balance that because we can see it, but our cameras don't. So here's a, a, a photo up in, uh, in Mount Rainier National Park. You know, probably half hour, hour after sunrise, but up in the hills, and so it's not getting direct sunlight yet. And it's just the way the light was playing and everything was just—it looked really cool. Like I saw, I just walked by it and it stopped me because I saw so much more depth here. Right, the background looked a little bit darker. Um, the foreground, like I just—I saw so much more depth to these leaves and everything. So, so my job now is to try to create that depth. Um, so I grabbed the photo and I looked at it. I'm like, ah, oh, it looks looks kind of flat. And by the way, guys, you're you're seeing my raw photo. I'm hitting reset. This is this is what came out of my camera. So the very first step in in my workflow is almost always going to be whites and blacks. All right. When I shoot portraits, when I shoot portraits, a lot of times the first step in my workflow is just balancing exposure. Right. You know, is it a little bit dark? Is it a little bit light? And I'll balance the exposure. Um, but with landscapes, exposure is kind of difficult because it's like the sledgehammer of adjustments. It, it modifies everything. So whites and blacks gives me a good base point for contrast. So if I hold down uh, the Option or Alt key and I click on the whites, see how everything goes black? I just drag it to the right and I get a couple of little specks there. That means I'm, I'm getting close to a white point. Now, in this example here, do I want to go all the way to where like there's a lot? Probably not, because I don't necessarily need, I don't want my photo to be super bright. So I'm going to pull back to where just there's a few little specks there. Same thing on blacks. Option or alt click, pull to the left, and that gives me a good black point. Okay. That's good. It's already started to deepen some of these areas a little bit. I might pull back on the whites just a hair. 
but it's already started to kind of deepen everything back there, give me a little bit more depth. Okay. Um, at this point, I'll probably pull back on the exposure a little bit. And now, see, like as soon as I see that, now we're getting really close. I remember seeing some streaks of light on here that, that stood out to me. So now we're getting a little bit closer. Uh, color balance. All right. Uh, I usually shoot my landscapes cloudy or shady. I, I like a warm photo. It's just my style is is very warm. So uh, color balance. I think we're actually pretty good here, but you know, I can maybe warm it just a little bit. Um, I don't do too much. I don't. The clarity will probably help this a little bit. Remember, it adds that contrast. So here's a here's the problem though. We got to be really careful with this, and I'm glad we came up uh, on this example. Is if I crank up the clarity, what we don't want to happen, do, do you guys see the background there? All right. So we spend a lot of money on lenses to make backgrounds look soft, right? We spend, you know, you get these 2.8, 1.8, 1.4, you get all these lenses with, with really wide apertures, really low f-stop numbers. You spend a lot of money on them. And what happens is, is when you go in here and you crank up your clarity, you know what you just did? You took that nice soft background that was meant to be soft because I want you to focus on this. You took that nice soft background, you just made it contrasty and you made it almost glow in certain areas. Here's another example. I have I have an image open in Photoshop. All right, so here's a portrait. Same thing. It's, it's not camera raw, but if you didn't know, if you're in Photoshop and you go to the filter menu, you can access the camera raw filter. It's just the same thing. The, this clarity adjustment that I'm doing over here is the same exact what I just did in Lightroom. But regardless of the fact that you know I wouldn't want to push that much clarity on her her face either. But watch what see when you you take a portrait, see what it does. That's before. That's after. See how harsh it makes that background. Again, we pay a lot of money and do a lot of pain. You know, we, we really try to pre-plan f2.8 to get that nice wide aperture to, to make our photos look, you know, almost have all that depth. And then what do we do? We go in there and we throw clarity on it and we, we, we bring that background to light. It almost makes it look, it almost makes it look grungy in some way. So it's not really, we want to keep away from that. Anyway, so that's why I'm not going to crank up too much clarity here. I could always paint it in with the brush. Um, detail. So I'll always, always go down here and hit detail. I'm going to add my sharpening. You really got to be in, zoomed into 100% to see it. So I'm going to zoom in here. I usually crank the sharpening up quite a bit too. I mean, 80, 90%. You can get away with a lot. My radius, I'll just 1.4 is usually 1.4 or 1.5. You can almost leave it there forever. Um, and then detail kind of says, says, all right. If I, if I leave detail really down low, it's only going to look for the contrasty stuff to sharpen. As I increase detail, it starts to look a little for a little bit more, and you'll see a little bit of texture. That's before, it's after. So you can start to see that texture come through. Um, it's, it's okay. I can, I can crank up my detail because I think the photo can hold a lot, and then I just increase my masking. Do you see that go away? Here, let me drop it down. That's before. That's at, or sorry, that's before, after. All right, so you can really see a lot of that texture start to go away when I mask it away. Okay, uh, a lot of people always ask about noise reduction. Um, not as much of a, a factor for our landscape photos because most of the time we're on a tripod. All right, so we're we don't really have that need to crank up our our ISO because uh, most of the time we're going to be on a tripod trying to capture a nice, really sharp photo. But noise reduction, this would be the time to go in here and do it. And I would do it inside of Lightroom because Lightroom's got really good noise reduction. And then the last, last step for your depth is probably the most important one, and that is we want to help draw, draw the viewer to what we want to see. So what I'll do is I'll take my exposure. I'm using that same brush tool that we used before, and now I'll just go in here and I'll start to brush in some of the background. Um, anybody out there has a Wacom pen and tablet? Uh, Wacom W-A-C-O-M. Here, let me I'll throw it up on the. So that's the uh, that's that code for 30% off. Wacom.com. 
Uh, they make these pen and tablets. Uh, here, I'll put it up for a second. They make these pen and tablets that are pressure sensitive, so your mouse is basically on or off. But if you notice what I'm doing here, I'm actually brushing a little bit lighter, brushing a little bit harder back here. And then when I get over here, I'm brushing a little bit lighter. Okay, It's probably a little bit difficult to see the difference, but let me show you because it gets pretty compelling. Watch. I'm going to just really crank down my exposure. All right, so I'm going to brush very light here, and I'm going to brush very hard here. See the difference? So you get a lot more control with something like that. I, can't, I, I definitely recommend them. Um, if you're doing a lot of a lot of work like this, but we'll just go through. And I'm just kind of making things darker that I don't want you to look at. I can control it after the fact, and then what I can do is hit new, bring the exposure the other way, and I can make things a little bit brighter. So depth is such a key part of these types of photos. To get that depth, and this is one of the ways that I get it, is to use that brush and to go in there um, and kind of paint in the areas that you want people um, to not see and then maybe brighten up the areas that you want people to, to really concentrate on. So if I show you my, uh, my before and after, that's before, that's after. So before, after. All right, cool. Uh, how we doing? We uh, we good? We good to go? Or anybody? Uh, any questions along the way here? Yeah, we have another question for you. Just to clarify um, about the relationship between Lightroom and On One Photo Ten. Do you have to use Lightroom when using On One Photo Ten, or is it a standalone program? Uh, nope. On One is a uh, On One Ten is a standalone program. I I have it open right here. And uh, it's got all the apps and modules over here on the left-hand side. Um, the one I was using was called Effects, but there's obviously, if you look down over here, uh, there's there's layers, there's a browse module. A browse module, I actually use the browse module more than, um, in some ways I use the browse module to look at my photos a little bit more than Lightroom these days. It, best thing I can do is show you, like, I'm going to click on, I'm going to click on a, uh, I'm going to click on a folder here. And it it renders the thumbnails almost instantly. And then what's pretty cool about it too is that I can hit the right arrow key and I'm just going through the photos really fast. So I do a lot of my culling, like a lot of the the when I'm just looking through my photos, um, I do a lot of that inside this browse app and on one. But yeah, it's standalone. I could take a photo from here and I could click the uh, the effects icon over here. And it'll take me into that same place I was before. So it is a plug into Lightroom and Photoshop or standalone. Great. And then Hector asked, um, to see the painted area, do you press O or is there another way to do that? To see the painted area. So you click on your brush tool. And then when you hover over your photo, you're going to see these little uh, these little dots. So there's a couple of things you could do. One would be just hover your mouse over that dot, and you'll see it. You'll see it in red. Um, the other thing is, it's if you go down here to the bottom, there's a little checkbox, show selected mask overlay. So if I turn that checkbox on, when I click on one of those dots, it shows it. And I do believe that O is the keyboard shortcut for that. So yeah, he was, uh, he was right in that. So you don't even have to click the checkbox. You can just hit O for overlay. Great. Thank you. Cool. OK. Uh, let's see here. Light, 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 light. Here's another cool one. Um, oh, where'd my photo go? All right. We're going to take a – hold on a second. It's uh, – my photo went away on me. Oh, just let me go find it. Hopefully this happened to, like, other people, too. And don't say it doesn't. I know everybody loses their photo at some point from Lightroom. There it is. Hold on. I think it's that one. Zero, four, five. Okay. Well, I just had to link it back up to my drive. I must have disconnected it and reconnected it. Um, okay. So light is another huge one. Let's go take this one. Ugh, go away. Hold on. It's giving me a... Okay. 
So we'll take this one from uh, we'll take this one from start to finish. I'm going to go to the basic panel. I'm going to do the same things that I did before, right? Whites and blacks. I option or alt click. Get a little white point there. Bring it to the left on the blacks. Get a little bit of a black point there. It gives me a good amount of contrast. Um, color temperature. I'll probably warm this one up a little bit. Highlights, not too many highlights on the photo here, so I don't really have to work with highlights. Shadows, you could open up the shadows. I don't know that I really need to in this example here. I actually kind of like a little bit more of the contrasty look. Um, let's see, down here to detail. Remember I said you got to be zoomed into 100%, so I'll kind of zoom in on a good, a good area up front here. 80, 90% radius. Leave it at 1.5, and then detail. I can handle a lot of detail in this. Um, there's so much detail throughout this photo that I know there's a little bit of texture, and I might mask a little bit away, but you'll never see that, even if we print it. And that's that's a big, uh, you know, while we're we're talking about this, and especially since you know you're you're watching this through Nations, um, a big question that I get, and we're gonna zoom in here, is when it comes to noise and this texture. Um, when it comes to printing. So when you're printing your photos, uh, no one's going to see this. If I, if I crank this up and I don't do any masking, and so you can see, you could see some of that texture there. No one's going to ever see that when I post this photo on the web. All right? You'd have to be a pixel peeper and have the original file to zoom into 100%. So we don't do noise reduction um, and, and even a lot of our sharpening. We don't really do our noise reduction and our sharpening as much for posting our photos on the web. We're doing it for printing. Okay, we're trying to we're we're trying to make sure because when this image gets blown up, now it's bigger and it's hanging on the wall. Now, if somebody walks up and really wants to to pixel peep at it, they'll start to see some of that noise and that texture. So we're only doing most of our sharpening and, and most of our noise reduction for print. The interesting thing about it is that the process of printing actually smooths out a lot of your your noise. Okay, when the ink hits the paper, um, you know, it tends to spread a little bit, and so it actually smooths out a little bit of your noise. So believe it or not, you can get away if you're going to print this. You can get away. I, you know, a lot of people would say I over sharpen this, and I would. I wouldn't even bother saving a separate copy for the web because remember, when you see it at this size, you'll never ever see that noise. It's only when you blow it up and zoom in that you'd see that. So if this were the image I sent off to print, it is a little textured. It does have a little bit of over sharpening. I'd be good with that because I know that that will smooth out during the printing process and that the photo will actually look really sharp. All right. So uh, next thing I do here is I'll, I'll usually, hit, especially if I'm shooting wide angle, go to the lens corrections. There's a little checkbox here to enable profile. You'll see it'll get rid of a little bit of the vignetting and a little bit of that uh, angle here. Uh, if you're going to do any cropping, this is the place to do it. So if you want to get any crop in, you could probably straighten it just a hair this way too. This would be the time to do it. Um, and then one of my favorite finishing steps is the vignette. Uh, I come down here to that effects panel. I just take the amount slider to the left. And I'm basically just using these sliders. I don't want you to know I added a vignette. So if I did this, like, that's bad, okay? Um, I'm going to feather. That's what that feathering slider does. Hopefully it makes it look a little bit more natural. Um, and there's nothing saying I can't come back up to the basic panel, say I want to maybe boost my exposure a little bit more, maybe try the whites. All right, there's nothing saying that I can't come back and do any of those adjustments afterwards. All right, maybe even a little bit of contrast and clarity here. Probably warm it up. So here's the here's the final finishing technique for this, and that is light. What I'll usually do is I'll search around the photo for a place where I know light is coming from. So as I look at this photo, like I know back here, here's where all the the openings in the trees were and everything. So one of my favorite little techniques is I'll take, see the brush over here? Right next to it is what's called the radial filter. It works the same way as the brush in that I get all these sliders. So what I'll do is I'll open up the exposure and I'll 
crank up the temperature. All right, I'm just going to click and drag. And what it just did is it protected everything in the circle and it made everything else bright and yellow. So what I want is the opposite. So I'm going to go down here to the bottom of that panel and just choose invert. And now what I have is I have this little spotlight that I can kind of move around and almost make it look like I'm just enhancing the light that was already coming into this. I'm just enhancing that. And I do this all the time on my photos. It's just like a little spotlight. I can pull it around. If I wanted to bring attention over here, I could. Um, I'm just dragging it around to part of the photo that I want to draw attention to and also just enhance the light. And especially on a flat day like this, these, you know, it, it, I'm in this place. I mean, it's fall. You got these gorgeous waterfalls cascading down. Like, it feels great. But when I look at the before photo, it feels flat, right? It didn't really feel that way. I mean, there was light coming in here. There was a little bit of sunlight. You, you know, it just it has a very different feeling to it. So that's why I'm always going to go in there, and I'm going to try to bring those things out of the photo. Um, I'm going to use a, another example. Same thing. See? If I were to take this photo, um, I'd probably crop it a little bit this way. Whites and blacks. Same thing we did before. Open up my shadows a little bit. Pull down my highlights. You see this, it's almost too bright in some of those spots. All right, so pull down, pull down my highlights a little bit. You can definitely add some clarity and some warmth to it. But when I add this, again, remember, it's going to use the same settings as before. I just need to invert it. So now I can kind of make it look like that light is really kind of creeping in a little bit more than it was. Um, if I throw a vignette on this, I think it's a good finishing. Okay. We also we talked about depth. So now we're starting to mix some of these tips and techniques together. Uh, we talked about depth before. I would probably take my brush and increase the exposure and paint a little bit. Because I just remember when I was walking up this creek, I just remember the, the way the water looked compared to everything else, the contrast to the, the bright water and everything else here is what kind of made me stop to take the picture. So we want to bring that depth out, maybe even paint that rock a little bit. I probably still crop that a little bit, but take a look. That's before, after. All right, so lots of things that we can do um, as we start to mix some of these techniques together. Uh, same thing, you know, you saw that one. I don't know if I showed you the before and after, but that's before, that's after. And we did both of those photos all in Lightroom. You know, I told you before, I'm very, very repetitive. Those are the same steps for each photo. All right, uh, I will do one more here, and let's see here. So the, the last tip is going to be the sky. Um, the sky is going to be one of the most important parts of our photo, and, and we have to learn to tame that. So one of the things that I do here is I'll go through, I'll go through my editing process. It's the same, right? Whites and blacks, option or alt click, get a white point and a black point. Uh, shadows, we can open up the shadows, highlights. I can close down the highlight, and it does a pretty good job, but it's still, it's still kind of, still almost kind of washed out back there. We saw that. We saw that D Hayes started to do a good job, but see what it's doing to the color. Right? It'd be really difficult for me to just paint that mountain in and everything else and have it to look realistic because you can see, you can see as I crank up my D haze, like it, it's it's starting to bleed in a darker blue up here. So D haze isn't really getting us where we need to. So what I would use now is that third tool in the graduated filter, which is the same as the brush, the same as a radio filter. It just does it basically in a line. So I bring my exposure to the left because I want to make this darker and I click and I drag down. Okay, so 
I'll undo that. Again, the graduated filter. It, it simulates a neutral density grad filter that we would use to use. I don't use them anymore in the field. It's a piece of glass that goes from dark to clear. You hold it over your camera. Same concept, dark, dark up here eventually graduates to clear down here. What that lets me do is now I can tame my sky a little bit more reliably. And then I can control it, right? I can control exactly how dark I want it to be. But here's where, here's where it gets really cool, and this is the, the last part of the tip, which is once you, once you start to tame your sky, which is such an important part to this, um, we have so many more controls for this. So traditionally with the graduated filter, if I did this, what starts to happen? All these trees start to get dark, all right, because they're getting darkened as well. Well, with a traditional graduated filter over my camera lens, I can't do anything about it. But with this, what are these trees? They're in shadows, right? So if I increase the shadow slider, I can bring all the detail back out. So I'm still able to retain the darker sky, all the nice light that it's giving on the mountain there, maybe even pull back a little bit on the highlights. I'm still able to retain all that, and now I'm able to retain all the detail that I would have lost in the trees if I did this with just a filter over my lens. And then the other cool part is, normally what I would do here is I would have warmed this whole photo because it was sunrise, so I would have taken this and warmed it up. The problem is if you look at my sky, see how it starts to get muddy? Um, the, the bigger problem with this is if you print this, it starts to get it almost starts to look yellow and take on a brownish color to it. All right? As much as it looks on the screen, um, one, these colors here get really affected by our printing. Um, so when I, if I, when I print this out, that bluish yellow color almost turns into a, a tannish brown color, and it, it just it takes away from the photo. What I can do over here is I can go to my temperature and I can bring blue back in. Because remember, it's just controlling. This is the line. Whatever's above this line is getting the effect. Whatever's below is not getting the effect. So now I can bring a little bit of blue back in there. Again, it's it's as important as it is, as important as it is for what we see on screen here. Um, something like that becomes really important for printing because it's it the the colors will never come back the way that you thought, and uh, they're they're going to tend to favor that muddy type of a color even more. Um, that's the last tip as far as taming your sky and using that filter with all the different little settings that you can use inside of there. Uh, I will finish it off with a vignette and then I'll give you the one last, since I was talking about printing, I'm going to give you my one last finishing printing tip here, which is if you're editing your photo, chances are you know, you got a computer screen, um, even worse if you're just doing it on a laptop screen, because you know what happens? What happens is, is you miss that. All right. So we get all these little sensor spots. And when you see your photos smaller, you tend to miss them a lot more. And I don't know about you, but I can't be the only one that has gone through the, the process of spending the time and money to get a nice photo printed, only to realize that I forgot to remove spots from it. And will everybody see it? I don't know. You know, most people shouldn't come that close to your, your photo to see it, but still, it's one of those things that bugs you eternally if this is something that you've put up um, and you did spend all that time and effort and money. So Lightroom gives us a really good way to get rid of that stuff, and that is there's a little tool up here called the Spot Removal Tool. All right? So when you click on it, um, because I can see the spot, all I'd have to do, I'll zoom in a little bit, all I'd have to do is paint over it and it goes away. But remember, the problem is, is that a lot of times we don't see them. There's a little checkbox down here called Visualize Spots. When I turn it on, I can kind of control the contrastiness of the photo, and now I can see all these little hidden problems that are back here in the photo. Not all of them are totally going to be viewable, but still, like something like that, like if I turn this off, you know, it might be hard for you to see, I'm not sure, but I can see it. Now I can see it. That I know it's there, I can see it. And it's one of those things, again, when you print it, 
those things tend to get accentuated and stand out more. So if you're going to be printing your work, you want to make sure you turn on uh, that little spot removal tool, but most importantly, make sure you turn on the option down here to visualize the spots. And that's what's going to give you that little, uh, that little black and white view so that you can actually really see it. Okay? So uh, that pretty much wraps up my five tips. I think it became more like seven or eight or nine, but I don't think you guys are complaining. Um, happy to take any questions if we got them. And yeah, Lisa asked um, how to know where to place the pin on the graduated filter. How to know where to place the pin on the graduated filter. It actually doesn't really matter. All right. Um, so when I go here, let me go ahead and I'll delete it. Just hit the delete key. Um, it doesn't really matter. If I place it over here and I click down, there's no difference than if I place it over here and I click down. All right? So it doesn't matter as much. The one thing that you could come across is, is if you place it and you click it and you're trying to ever so slightly get it straight, uh, the tip for you is hold down the shift key. You hold down the shift key. You can see like right now I'm at an angle. If I hold down shift, you see it just snapped to straight. So it doesn't necessarily matter where you place it. And even if you place it in the wrong place, um, you can click, you can just press on that little that little meatball thing and uh, you can move it around your photo anywhere you want. And then you can spread out the graduatedness, <laughs> the gradientness of it. You can spread it out or you can make it harder if you want to, just depending on how your horizon looks. Awesome. And Bob would like to know, is, um, is Apple Aperture capable of making any of these changes? Uh, Apple Aperture has many, many of those changes. Um, your problem is going to run into is that Aperture has been discontinued. So um, it, I believe it still works, but there, there has been no further development for Aperture for like the last year and a half, and there won't be any more. It's a, it's a discontinued product. So you're going to run into, you're eventually going to run into some problems there. Right, I think that wraps up our question. Awesome. Do you have a code for everybody? We sure do. We also will send out an email to everyone so you have the code in writing, but it's in all caps webinar MK and that's for $25 on your next MPL order and it expires at the end of this month. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Well, hey, before uh, before you guys sign off, I just want to say thank you to everybody uh, everybody out there for uh, for stopping in to see me. Um, if uh, if you want to follow anything I do, you can just check me out over at mattk.com. It's m-a-t-t-k.com, and uh, happy to see you over there. But thanks to a big thanks to Nations Photo Lab for having me on to do this, and thank you guys to uh, to everybody that came out today to watch it. Excellent. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks again. Take care.